presentation is going to be um, we're going to be very serious. See, some of us, some of us, we believe that we're living in normal times. The times in which we live are absolutely abnormal, very abnormal. You saw on the news this week. What what dominated the news? I think it took place Wednesday. The cameraman, you remember that? You know, life is so precious. You know those two individuals, that woman and that man, who were uh, murdered? They really believed that they would be alive today. I guarantee it. The point is, tomorrow is not guaranteed to anyone in this building. You have no idea if you're getting home this evening. You have no clue. That's why it is imperative that we are so in love with Jesus, nothing else matters. And I'm going to show you where we are in time. So we're not living in normal times. So before we get into the Bible and this presentation, what are we going to do? We're going to pray. I'm going to give you all a few moments to pray for the Holy Spirit to speak to you. You're going to pray for the Holy Ghost and you're going to pray for my Pastor Mirage as I speak. Father, speak through your word by the power of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You know, there's an award online. It's called the Pukies. You ever heard of that? There's a website called createdgay.com. And the Pukey Award is given to the person who makes Jesus want to vomit. You ever heard of that? That's kind of interesting to me. Uh, this, this website is, is, is pro-gay lifestyle, okay? And if you speak against homosexuality, you receive the Pukey Award because you make Jesus sick. So these are Christians who claim to be gay and God accepts them. Now, I want to say this. Now, no one is here. I'm not here to bash homosexual people because we all have issues, all right? God loves them as much as he loves you. He just hates the sin. So if you're gay, if you're struggling with that, we welcome you here. I'll say amen for you. Amen. Everybody's welcome because we're all a mess without Jesus. But let's be straight. He doesn't want you to stay in your sin, no matter what sin it is. So you get a pukey if you make Jesus sick by speaking against this sin. And you know, there's some very well-known folk who are on this website who received the pukey award, right? You ever heard of this guy? Yeah, Russian president. Pope Benedict. Yeah, you ever heard of Franklin Graham? Son of Billy. Now, Billy Graham is a world, like the most famous evangelist, right? Very famous. And you have Jimmy Swagger. You ever heard of Jimmy Swagger? Very, very, very famous preacher, very nice singer, yada, yada. I mean, these are big names, are they not? I mean, you, you have presidents and popes. I mean, these are, these are huge names. You know who is also on this list? You ever heard of him? <laughs> I'm not joking. Your pastor is on this list. You know why? I gave this same presentation, very similar. I was invited to one of our big universities. And I gave this presentation. And on that campus, I was not aware of it, that they have an unofficial homosexual um, club, you can say. Okay? So that club was very offended. And after I did this presentation, I got calls from the school, emails, it was something else. Some of those folk were very upset at one of our colleges. You know why? Because there are so many Adventists that are so stuck on sin. We want to be accommodating. Yes, yes, please come. I already stated that. I want them here. But I want you to come in here gay and leave straight by the power of the Holy Ghost. So we're not, Pastor Alvin is not here to condemn anyone. 
But I've learned. I've been a minister for only a little, a seven and a half years, and I have learned that Adventists, we don't all think the same. You got to ask some Adventists who believe in October 22, 1844. Some Adventists, they don't believe in that. Desmond Ford, he doesn't believe in it. You got some Adventists believe in 1888 message. Some Adventists don't believe in that. We don't agree in all things. That's just how it is. And those folk got angry at me. I don't know how they got a hold of that message, this website, but they put me right there with these big shots. And I'm a little shot. <laughs> I don't know what I'm doing. I'm an Adventist pastor. <laughs> I'm not a president. But I will never back down from preaching the truth in Jesus. Because the times in which we live, Satan is not joking. He's not playing. Satan wants to destroy every single person in this building. We're the ones we think we have forever. Satan knows he has a short time. Brothers and sisters, you don't have forever. Where are we in time? It's going to be very clear. It's going to be very clear in this presentation. I don't even call this a sermon. It's a presentation. The days of Lot. You know, I want to read this quote as we begin here from Ellen White. Because I do believe that Ellen White is a prophet of the Lord. There are some Adventists, they don't believe in that either. We were not on the same page. She was a prophet of God. Only two amens. The shortness of time is urged as an incentive for us to seek righteousness and to make Christ our friend. This is not the great motive. It savors of selfishness. Is it necessary that the terrors of the day of God be held before us to compel us through fear to right action. This ought not to be. So Ellen White says, now she doesn't say you don't bring um, last day events or the shortness of time before people. She does not say don't do that. She says you do not use that as a motive of fear so people can do what's right. You know, you're welcome. And you know how it is? I, as a minister, I am not making this up. I know so many Seventh-day Adventists who are more afraid of Jesus than in love with him. You know why? Because a lot of Adventists, they don't understand the investigative judgment. And if you don't understand the investigative judgment, you will be terrified of the Christ. Terrified. So a lot of folk, they walk on pins and needles, don't even know if they have a relationship with Christ. A lot of people fear. We don't operate based on fear. The Bible says God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind. There's nothing to fear, brothers and sisters. She said, hey, we don't do this. To see Christ, to make Christ your friend, you got to scare the people, present before them the shortness of time. I love the way she ends the quote. Watch how she ends it. Jesus is attractive. Wow. You all awake this morning? Can you say amen to that? Amen. amen. Isn't Jesus attractive to you? Only one amen. I thank God that those three words are powerful. Jesus is attractive. You present Jesus, people will come. But we have to preach the last days because it's prophecy. We have to talk about the shortness of time because it's biblical. Again, she does not say do not preach that. She says don't put it before the people all the time. You don't have to do that, right? It's not necessary. You know I love history. I love reading. And here, this is a picture of the African slave trade we call this the Gold Coast of Africa. My wife and I went here around this area last year. Awesome country. And we know the slave trade took place here, and the slaves, many of the slaves were taken to the southern parts of the United States of America, to the Caribbean, uh, so forth and so on. They were shackled. And then you had slave trade ships. And you have, you see this ship? These, these are people. Let me zoom in on that. These are people who are so cramped, they're so tight, as they pass the Atlantic Ocean, many of them would die on the way here. Can you imagine? You're like this for that voyage? When you're like this on a ship in shackles, you defecate and urinate on yourself. And you vomit. Horrible ideal. But it took place. It's our history. Great sale of slaves. This is, this is a real article I found online. January 10, 1855. You ever heard of that term wench, when a woman is called a wench? You ever heard of that? Some of you saying, yeah. 
A wench is a female slave. It's a derogatory term for a female slave. It's a wench. But here you have these folk, for example, three bucks. These are males. Age 20 to 26, strong, able-bodied, so forth and so on. They'll bring them to America, put them on the, 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 the selling block, or whatever you want to call it. Sell these slaves. I wonder how much the, the, a slave ran, the price of a life. History says $1,200 to $1,250 for Negroes. How does one have the nerve to put a price on another human being? But that's our history. I'm going somewhere with this. This is the illustration. And we know what took place, right? Who was that? Abraham Lincoln, January 1st, 1863. Uh, that's the year that uh, we became a church, 1863. But nonetheless, January 1st, 1863, the Emancipation Proclamation was signed by our 16th president. And you know, when he signed that document to, to end the Civil War, there were many slaves that stayed on the plantation with the slave owner. That's a slave mentality. I mean, you have freedom and you are still willing to stay as a slave? There are many Christians just like that. Jesus died so that we can be liberated from sin. But there are many Christians who come to church every Saturday shackled by invisible chains. What is that sin that has you bound? Brothers and sisters, we are free when we have Jesus. We're free. We are not slaves. We should not have that slavery mentality. All of us in this building, we're not slaves. We're pilgrims. What did I just say? Pilgrims. We are pilgrims passing through this land. We're not slaves. We're liberated. Brothers and sisters, we all need help. We desperately, desperately need Jesus. We're pilgrims. The Bible tells us. If you're taking notes, take down these references. These all died in faith. I love it. Not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, were assured of them. Embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and what, everybody? We're not, we're not slaves. We're pilgrims. You are a pilgrim. Pilgrims on the earth, because our final destination is heaven. For those who say such things declare plainly that they seek a homeland. I wonder what kind of homeland is that? Is that Fresno? Oh, no. But now they desire a better, that is, a heavenly country. This is what we are seeking for, brothers and sisters, a heavenly country. We're pilgrims, not slaves. How close are we to the end? How close are we? Let me read from Ellen White, because she's a prophet. She says... Why Jesus is not yet here. Listen to these words. For 40 years did unbelief, murmuring, and rebellion shut out ancient Israel from the land of Canaan. The same sins have delayed the entrance of modern Israel into the heavenly Canaan. What's in? In neither case were the promises of God at fault. It is unbelief, the worldliness of unconsecration and strife among the Lord's professed people that have kept us in this world of sin and sorrow so many years. She says right here, the strife amongst us. In other words, it's because one reason he is not here is because church folk cannot get along. You ever been in a church like that? <laughs> Some church, they just can't get along. Strife and contention among the brethren. She goes on to say in another quote, The long night of gloom is trying, but the morning is deferred in mercy. Because if the master should come, so many would be found unready. Oh, oh. think on that. The four angels in Revelation 14, literally, they're holding back, well, symbolically, they're holding back the four winds of strife because they cannot let them go because Jesus knows if they let them go and the time of trouble hits and Jesus comes back, there'll be so many folk lost, 
Jesus says, I'll, hold a little, I'll wait a little longer. They're not ready. I'll delay, she says, in mercy. Brothers and sisters, if it wasn't for the mercy of God, where would you be? Where would Pastor Mirage be? If it wasn't for God's mercy and his grace, we would be lost. God says, I can't come back yet. My people, they're too in love with sin. I'm going to hold back a little longer. But one day the Bible tells us, he that shall come will come and will not tarry. Pilgrims, you know what we do? Because we're not slaves. Pilgrims, we study prophecy. Seventh-day Adventists, our church, very big, very started on a, based on a prophetic movement. And we are very, very big when it comes to prophecy. Isn't that right? Question. What, what is the, the primary reason for Bible prophecy? Does anybody know? What do you think? The, the number one reason for Bible prophecy. Ed? Okay, very good. So Ed is saying uh, the number one reason for Bible prophecy is to know the future. Is that true, yes or no? What do you think? If I was sitting where you're sitting, my answer would be yes. But listen to me very carefully. The number one reason for Bible prophecy is not knowing the future. Did you hear what I just said? Because you and I can know the future and come up in the second resurrection. You're not listening to what I'm saying. You hear what I'm saying? Therefore, Bible prophecy, knowing the future, cannot be primary. It must be secondary in nature. It cannot be number one. The question then begs to be asked as we study this morning, what then is the number one reason for Bible prophecy? The number one reason for Bible prophecy is so that you and I can fall in love with Jesus Christ. Doesn't that make sense? It makes a lot of sense. Let's prove it. Turn your Bibles to 2 Peter. Let's go to the Bible. 2 Peter. 2 Peter, where are we in time? 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1 here. 2 Peter... <clears throat> Chapter 1, looking at prophecy this morning, because time is running out. We are living on borrowed time. Second Peter, if, as long as you can read, get a Bible. Some people say, well, you might be too young. No, if you can read, grab a Bible. Is everybody there? Second Peter chapter 1. I'll wait on you. I'm not rushing this morning. This is too important. Second Peter chapter 1. Are we there? Now, now this is what we're going to do, because I'm going to show you uh, that Jesus is number one when it comes to prophecy, okay? Uh, the Apostle Peter, of course, he's writing. And what he's going to do, he is building like a crescendo. You know what a crescendo is? You know, like when you're singing a song, like it goes like, like you start off low, like, uh, to the apex or the zenith. That is a crescendo. You start off low, you get high. Everybody follow me so far. What Peter is doing, Peter is building a crescendo. He's getting higher and higher, and he's going to show us in 2 Peter chapter 1 the primary reason for prophecy. And what he's going to do, he's going to mention the name of Jesus several times. Okay? And when he mentions the name of Jesus, I want you to, put, uh, to count it mentally in your mind, and then I'm going to ask you how many times he mentions Jesus. Okay? Watch what he does. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 1. The Bible says, Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ. That's number one, the first time. To them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. That's two. Verse 2. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Skip to verse 8. Verse 8. 
For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 11. For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly in the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Verse 14. Knowing that shortly I must put off this my tabernacle, even as our Lord Jesus Christ have showed me. Verse 16. For we have not followed cunningly devised fables uh, when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. But were I witnesses of his majesty. Pause. How many times did Peter... How many times does Peter mention Jesus Christ? Seven times. It's the perfect number. Peter is saying this. It's all about Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. And he keeps on building Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. After he lays the foundation on Christ, he then mentions prophecy in verse 19. Go to verse 19. Verse 19, the Bible says, We have also a more sure word of what? See, he mentions Jesus first constantly, continually. Then he mentions prophecy second because that is secondary. The future is secondary. Jesus is primary. Now watch Peter. He's going to get deeper. Watch him. Verse 19. We have also a more or short of prophecy. Whereunto ye do well that ye take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn. Now watch. And the day star arise in your, what everybody? Now watch, now watch Peter, he's awesome. Peter says, look, it's about Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. This is why prophecy is given. Then he says prophecy is given so the day star can arise in our hearts. Pause. Who is this star? Revelation 22. Let's go to Revelation 22. Let's prove all of it from the Bible. Revelation 22. Revelation 22. Revelation 22, verse 16. Revelation 22, verse 16. Revelation 22, verse 16. And now listen to Jesus, his words. Jesus says in verse 16, I, Jesus, have set mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright and morning star. Star. Jesus says, hey, that's me. Who Peter is referring to, this, this day star, it's me. So what Peter says, going back to 2 Peter 1, Peter says, prophecy is given to every single person on planet Earth. The number one reason for prophecy is so that Jesus Christ can rise in our hearts. That's it, not the future. You got it, Ed? That's it. Because it must be Jesus. Because Satan knows the future. He knows Bible prophecy, but he's, he's going to be lost. Jesus is always primary, brothers and sisters. Always. So when we see, we're going to see on the screen, when we see Bible prophecy literally coming to fulfillment, we have only one response. Thank you, Jesus. I'm not afraid. Thank you, Jesus. I'm falling more in love with you. This prophecy is coming to fulfillment. This prophecy is taking place. I'm so excited. I'm so in love with Jesus because prophecy is being fulfilled. It's the only response. We never respond out of fear. It's all about love with Jesus. It's all about love. That's it. So let's get to our scripture reading. Okay? On the screen, scripture reading. <clears throat> Likewise, oh God help us, also as it was in the days of Lot, they did eat, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built it. Verse 30, even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. This word revealed, well, what event is this describing? What event is that? Second coming. The Bible tells us, as it was during the time of Lot, right before, right before Jesus comes back the second time, planet Earth will be just like how it was in Sodom. How was it in Sodom? Was Sodom a really nice place? Was Sodom beautiful? Did it look like the ghetto? Well, the Bible says it looked like the garden. Sodom was so beautiful, it looked like the Garden of Eden. It's how gorgeous it was. It wasn't the projects. 
But the Bible says, just like it was in the time, what happened? You remember those angels? How many angels came to, the, um, to meet uh, Abraham? Two. Do you know there was three of them, but one was Jesus? You remember that? The, the, the two angels, Jesus, he takes off. Two angels, um, they're outside, and they wanted to stay in the streets, the Bible says in Genesis 19. But Lot kept on insisting, come home with me, come home with me, come home with me. And these two angels came home with Lot. But the Bible goes on to say, we're going to read it later, that the men of the city, young and old, they come pounding on the door of Lot, literally almost banging it down. And they say, hey, we want to come inside. We don't want to meet and greet. We want to know them carnally. In other words, the men of the city, they wanted to have sex and sodomize angels. And if Jesus didn't take off, they would have tried to sodomize him too. You listening to what I'm saying this morning? This is serious business. That was real sick. Jesus says, before I come back, earth will be just like Sodom. Oh, how close are we to the second coming? I'm going to show you something. How close are we? Question. In 2015, does earth reflect Sodom? That's the easiest question all morning. Yes. This place is wicked, brothers and sisters. Earth is extremely wicked. You know, question. Can you be born gay? Listen to the question. Can someone be born gay? Of course not. Oh, I like that. I'm going to ask the next question. Can you be born with a proclivity, with a tendency toward being attracted to the same sex? Yes, you can be born. You can have, you, we know this. There are things, there are tendencies passed down your DNA you inherited from mama and daddy and grandpa. I'll show you the quote. All right. She says, patriarchs and prophets, if you're taking notes, 306. By inheritance and example, the sons become partakers of the father's sin, wrong tendencies, perverted appetites, and debased morals, homosexuality, as well as physical disease and degeneracy are transmitted as a legacy from father to son to the third and fourth generation. She quotes Exodus 20 right here. In other words, she is using the Bible to prove that there are some things that Alvin Mirage inherited that's in me from mommy and daddy. I had no control. No control over it. So again, before we continue more on this presentation, I'm not here to bash anyone. If you are struggling with this sin, maybe you inherited. Now, you weren't born with it. You inherited that. You're not born gay, I should say. But there are some things that have been passed down. I have a friend. We went to school um, together. His mama was a drunk. His daddy was a drunk. Whole family drunk. He never, he never took alcohol in his life. He, sa he said, as he was preaching, every now and then, he just has a strong urge to drink some alcohol. Why? He got it from mommy and daddy. Passed down the DNA. I had a, a former member of one of my churches. Both her and her sister, both of them, practiced homosexuality for years. Sisters. Two sisters are gay. They, they both had um, separate girlfriends and blah, blah, blah. Gay in one family. Why? It was passed down. And I'll never forget what she said. I'll never forget what she told me. Then she, well, she, she's, a, she's a Christian now. She goes all over preaching. This is just what she said. She said, yeah, you know, Alvin, my first birth, I had a, there was a problem. I came into this world attracted to women. That was my first birth. Then she said, that's exactly why I needed to be born again. Woo! I love it. The converting power of the Holy Ghost is real. She said, I had to be born again. And she's born again, and now she wants to marry a man. I'll say amen for you. Amen! Thank God that he still changes hearts. Praise God for that. Why gay parents may be the best parents. Seen this? 
were living in the time of Sodom. Watch. There are eight, at least 18 countries that have passed gay marriage. Let, let me tell you something, okay? Listen to me very carefully. We live here, specifically right here. Gay marriage, it has to be on a global scale. Listen to me very carefully. Gay marriage, because it's prophetic, gay marriage cannot be localized in one state or one city. 100% fact, it has to be global, and I'll tell you why later. It has to be. It has to be. At least 18 countries. Now, when I was growing up, when I was in high school, if somebody told me a few, um, uh, I was in high school in the 90s, if somebody told me just a few years later, 18 countries will legalize gay marriage, I would never believe them. I would, I would never believe that. Some of you grew up, you, you were born like in the 30s and 40s. You never saw this coming. And some of us, we still think, it's all right. Everything is fine. Everything is normal. What are you yelling and shouting for? It is not normal, brothers and sisters. It is not normal what we are beholding in 2015. Nothing normal about it. You pre if I preach this message in Canada, Canadian Supreme Court rules biblical speech opposing homosexual behavior is, is a hate crime. I might leave church in handcuffs. Oh, everything is all right. Calm down. No, no, it's not all right. I'm going to show you a timeline to show you how, how Satan, he just took his time. This gay agenda did not take place overnight. He took his time. He built his case. Timeline, timeline of gay marriage in the United States. All right. Now, this timeline was rather extensive, so I just broke it down uh, so we could understand it. I, I just don't have time for all the reading this morning, but it's, just, it's really interesting. I love it. In 1972, before I was born, the U.S. Supreme Court let stand a Minnesota Supreme Court ruling that the law does not allow for same-sex marriage. So in 1972, Satan began to push this agenda to legalize same-sex marriage in America. This is awesome. In 1972, the Supreme Court said, no way! It was in 72. Satan says, okay, I got to keep on pushing. I'm not going to give up. I'm going to keep on pushing my agenda because he hates marriage. In 1986, the U.S. Supreme Court says, we are quite unwilling to find a fundamental right to sodomy, even in the privacy of one's home. They said in 1986, even in the privacy of your own home, we don't approve of it. Satan says, okay, I got to keep on pushing. I keep on pushing. Keeps on pushing. 1996, President Bill Clinton signs Defense of Marriage Act, DOMA. You remember that was defeated like a few years ago? You remember that? That was put down. Defining marriage as between a man and a woman for federal purposes. So, so in 1996, Bill Clinton, the president, says, hey, it's clear. Marriage is between a male and a female. By the way, there is no such thing as gay marriage. Marriage is male and female. That's a gay union. That's not a marriage. Satan says, man, I got to keep on pushing this thing. So in 1998, the debut of television show Will and Grace about a gay man and his best friend, a straight woman. You ever heard of that show? I know Adventists, I used to watch that trash. You know what Satan does now? In 1998, he says, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to make homosexuality look attractive, make it a comedy, let people laugh about it. Ha, ha, ha. Jesus is not laughing. You know why? Because when you laugh, you put your guard down. Oh, it's not that bad. It's just a comedy. It's all right. Now, on just about every comedy, somebody's gay on there. Why? It's so popular. It's so accepted. Make them laugh. Jesus is not laughing, brothers and sisters. That's real stuff. That's real stuff. In 1998, Satan kept on pushing. He still got, got a past gay marriage. Pushing, pushing, pushing. In 2000, Vermont becomes the first state to allow civil unions for same-sex couples. Civil unions is not the same as gay marriage. You don't have the same rights. So Satan says in 2000, man, I'm getting closer. I'm almost there. He keeps on pushing and pushing to legalize gay marriage. And he finally got what he wanted in 2004. The Massachusetts Supreme Court rules in favor of same-sex marriage and gay weddings begin. 
They celebrated a decade just last year of gay marriage, just last year. They said the homosexual community celebrated 10 years of gay marriage. Massachusetts was the first state Satan got what he wanted. You understand what's going on in this presentation? You understand how serious this presentation is? Let's go deeper. Let's go deeper. Barack Obama said in 2012, gay marriage, it doesn't weaken families, it strengthens families. Are you kidding me? The President of the United States talking like that. Now we do know that, that, that the, the United States of America, in, we are in Revelation 13. We're the second beast there. You think this stuff is coincidental? No, brother. No. You remember when this came out a few years ago? Seventh Gay Adventist. You remember that documentary? You ever seen that before? You never seen it? Let me, tell, let me explain this. This was a documentary that, that came out about um, three years ago. And on this documentary, it talks about gay, uh, I think it was three couples, and they're all homosexual. One was a former pastor. He got um, fired because of his sexual orientation. But nonetheless, they made this film called Seventh Gay Adventist of how they're marginalized, marginalized, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now look, folks. I don't care what you call yourself. All they did, they just dropped the, the D and put a G. Don't play with the name. Our name was given directly from God. Don't play with the name. Call yourself something else. But Satan hates marriage, and he hates Seventh-day Adventists. He hates this church, because we have the last day message. You all awake this morning? Church doesn't say amen. <laughs> I just love it. <laughs> amen. I love it. We are the remnant. We're not better. We just have the last message. We're not better than anyone. So we and those folk, those Adventists aside, let's come out with, oh, Seventh Gay Adventists. Foolishness. You remember this? June 26 this year. See what happened? Supreme Court rules in favor of same-sex marriage nationwide. Hmm. You know how serious that is? I remember when I heard that news Friday, I said, man, have mercy. I was actually driving up to Fresno from the Los Angeles area, and I heard it in the morning, early in the morning. I said, wow. You know why? Number one, it happened on Friday. You think that's coincidence? When did God perform the first marriage ceremony? You think that's coincidence? No, no brothers and sisters, Satan hates the marriage covenant. He hates it. So what he says, I'm going to bring my counterfeit, I'm going to pass it nationwide in the second beast of Revelation 13 on a Friday. How close are we to the end of time? How close are we? Watch. Watch, watch how close we are. Watch. ABC, this is March 25th, just a few months ago. ABC families, the Fosters, airs youngest ever gay kiss between two 13-year-old boys. Ooh. Ooh. But everything's normal. That's not normal. I don't know if you're listening to what I'm saying. ABC became a network in 1943. Okay? In 1943, 72 years. Within those 72 years, ABC never, ever, ever showed a homosexual gay kiss. Ever in 70 years. Two years! You know why? Because it wasn't time. It's time now, though. It's time now. It wasn't time then. And you know these young people? Oh, bro, bro, listen to me. These two young boys? You know, history, there is no new thing under the what? That's what Solomon says in Ecclesiastes chapter 1. There is nothing new. You know the same thing happened during the time of Lot? Go to Genesis 19. Go to Genesis 19. I'll show you how close we are. We're not living in normal times. No way. No way. Genesis 19. We'll go there. Let me show you something. Genesis 19. ABC, here's that. 13-year-old boys kissing. Wow. Genesis 19, are you there? All right. Let's read verse 1. I just love the Bible. 
The Bible says in verse 1, And there came two angels of Sodom at evening, and Lot sat in the gate of Sodom. And Lot, seeing them, arose up to meet them and bowed himself with the face toward the ground. And he said, Behold now, my lords, turn in. Come into my house, I pray you, into your servant's house, and tarry all night, and wash your feet. And ye shall rise up early and go on your ways. And they wait. They said, Nay, but we will abide in the street all night. And he pressed upon them greatly. And they turned into him and entered into his house. And he made them a feast and did break unleavened bread. And they did eat. Verse 4. Now watch verse 4. But before they lay down, the men of the city, even the men of Sodom, come past the house round, both old and what? All the people from every quarter. You know that word young there? That word young in Hebrew? <clears throat> the word young here is the Hebrew word nahar. It literally means a boy or a lad or a youth. You had young boys, you had teenagers banging down the door of Lot to sleep with some angels. Young gay. Same exact thing you find on ABC, young. It has to happen now. It, that, that couldn't happen. They couldn't air that a few years ago. They couldn't do it. Why? Because prophecy wasn't fulfilling five years ago like it's fulfilling today. You listen to what I'm saying? This is serious business. We are reflecting the image of Sodom perfectly. And some of us, oh, that's all right. I still got time. I still got time to fool around with sin. Everything's all right. Calm down, preacher. No, brother, it is not all right. Everything is not okay. Let's get deeper. Let's get, let, let me show you how deep this thing goes, all right? We know in the Garden of Eden, you have those, those two primary institutions. What were they? Or the institutions in the Garden of Eden. Of course, we had the original diet, but besides the original diet, come on. You had marriage and you had what? Sabbath. The Bible Sabbath. Listen to what Ellen White said. Take down this reference when you're studying on your own. Take down this reference, all right? She says here from Adventist Home 340, Blessed days of Eden when God pronounced all things very good. Then marriage and the Sabbath had their origin twin institutions, for the glory of God in the benefit of humanity. Wow. That quote has so much depth of meaning. How, how deep is this quote? God's twin institutions. What's the first one? True marriage. What's God's second twin institution? Sabbath. He had tw she clearly says these are twin institutions. All right? Very clear. Satan wants to counterfeit everything God has. If God's, true, if God's twin institution was a true Sabbath, true marriage, that means Satan's twin institution counterfeit must be gay marriage. Are you following what I'm saying, brothers and sisters? Gay marriage. If God has the true Sabbath, Satan's twin institution counterfeit must be what? Got to be Sunday. Oh, oh. How serious is that on the screen? How, how deep is that on the screen? You know how deep this is? Watch, I'll show you something. What's that word, everybody? Twin. Anybody here a twin here? Anybody here a twin? Anyone? You know, I went online looking for some twins. Couldn't really find any pictures I like, so I got this one here. You know who that is? <laughs> yeah, that's me and my brother. My brother and I. This is my father here. That's myself, and this is my brother. We're twins. We were born only one minute apart. My mom was trying to get us out. <laughs> only, well, only 60 seconds, that's it. And you know, I want to ask you something. When somebody is giving birth to twins, the time <clears throat> of conception, do they give birth to twins? Does one come out and the next one come out five years later? 
No. Does the next twin come out two years later? No. The time between giving birth to twins, the time is close. You're not listening to what I'm saying. You're not listening to what I'm saying. If she calls these twin institutions and with the, the gay, gay marriage has already been born, that means Sunday worship is next. It must be close because this is already here. And this is exactly why gay marriage has to be worldwide because the national Sunday law will be worldwide. They're twins. But we're living in normal times. It's no big deal. This is okay. Brothers and sisters, I'm stressing this for a reason. That's not normal. One twin has already been birthed. The second is coming. You think it's coincidental? What, you remember what she said? Do you, oh, Matt. Hey, look, look. If, you, if you're sleeping, don't miss the rest of the presentation. All right? Don't miss the rest of the presentation. Anybody recall what Senator Allen said? You remember what she said? I got the video. I didn't have to play it here because my, my computer's having issues. If you want to see the video, because some people, they have to see it from the lips of the person themselves. If you want to see the video, you can go Google it. It's on YouTube all over. What this senator said March of this year. Watch what she said. Direct quote. Whew. She says, we are slowly eroding religion at every opportunity we have. Probably we should be debating a bill requiring every American to attend a church of their choice on Sunday to see if we can get back to having a moral rebirth. Ooh, the senators are lawmakers. She just said that a few months ago in March this year. Now you got to examine her quotation. Look, look what she said. She says requiring, that's Revelation 13 language. Requiring every, now, brothers, she says every American, she does not say every Christian, every American includes Buddhist, Hindu, Confucian, all of it, every single one of them, she says gotta go. Watch her words. Don't miss this. She says eroding, requiring American Sunday moral. What we're going to do, we're going to do a comparison and contrast. I made this graph so we can get it. because We can't miss this. She says eroding, requiring Sunday American moral. Now watch what Ellen White says. Watch Ellen White because she's a prophet. Watch her. Great controversy, 587. She says, yet this very class put forth the claim that the fast spreading corruption is largely attributable to the desecration of the so-called Christian Sabbath, that's Sunday, and that the enforcement of Sunday observance would greatly improve the morals of society. This claim is especially urged in America where the doctrine of the true Sabbath has been most widely preached. Oh. Whew. God. You see what's going on on that screen? Well, let's, let's look at her words. Corruption, enforcement, Sunday morals, America. Now watch the comparison. She... Senator Allen says all this, watch what Ellen White says. She used corruption, same as eroding. She used enforcement, same as requiring. She used Sunday, she says Sunday. She says American, she says America. She says more, she says more. In other words, the senator paraphrased Ellen White and had no idea. Woo, God help us. Understand how serious that is? That woman had no idea what she was saying. Ellen White, man, she's talked about this stuff over a hundred years ago, and we literally see it coming to fulfillment in 2015, but some of us think everything's normal. I still got time. Okay. Why do you think the Pope's coming? Why do you think he's coming in September? Hmm? Now, I don't know the agenda. Look, look, folks, I'm not a prophet. I don't claim to be a prophet. I'm a pastor. Folks, this is the first time in the history of the United States of America where a pope is going to address Congress. He's only been in office for a little over two years. Ellen White says the final movements will be rapid ones. 
He's only been in office for a little over two years, and he's already going to address Congress? Come on, come on, folks. Come on, let, let, let's, let's be think. You don't even have to think on this stuff. I don't, I don't know. The Sunday law can pass in two years, ten years. I have no idea. All I know is that twin is about to be born. That's all I know. This is prophecy. Look, folks, can you imagine when he addresses Congress? And Senator Allen, that lady we just saw is there. I'm just using this as an illustration. And Senator Allen says, hey, we got the Pope here. We're lawmakers. I want to make a motion. I move that we require all Americans, doesn't matter your religious background, your preference, I move that we require every American to attend church of their choice on Sunday. Another senator, a uh, congressman, yeah, yeah, hey, I second that motion. All in favor say aye. Aye. The Pope is right there. What if a vote takes place? You know, if, when he comes and addresses Congress, on Sat uh, not Saturday, but uh, whenever he goes to address Congress, hypothetically, if, if they make a motion, so forth and so on, to, to, to put in a Sunday law, maybe, uh, say, for example, um, next year, 2016, if they were to do that, this place the following Saturday will be standing room only. You heard what I just said? This church will be so packed if the Sunday law were to pass. You know why? Because many Adventists operate on fear and not love. This place would be packed. Oh, Sunday law, I'm so scared, I'm so scared. You love Jesus? I'm just scared. Brothers and sisters, it's about love. It is about love with Jesus. When you see these things transpiring, what I just showed you in this presentation, you should, one response, thank you, Jesus, you're about to take us home. That's it. That's it. But there are so many countless Adventists. Oh, man. Um, you know Jesus? Man, I don't know if I know Jesus. I know tofu. I know carrots. I know broccoli. I don't go to the movies. Hey, you know Jesus? I don't know, man. No, because one day... This event is going to take place. It's going to get bigger and bigger coming from Orion's belt. Bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger with all, all the hosts of heaven. One day, this is literally going to happen. He's only coming back for those who loved him. That's it. If you're afraid of Jesus, he can't come back for you. Because you'll be afraid of Jesus in heaven. You have to love Jesus, the number one reason for Bible prophecy, so that the day star will rise in your heart. That's it. That's it. Got love them, brothers and sisters. Was the presentation clear? Do we have a long time left? Oh, if it's much longer, listen to. If it's much longer, if it takes a long time for the Sunday law to pass, it's only because. God's mercy. Hold those four winds just a little longer. Just a little longer. My people, they're not ready. They're still fooling with sin. Hold back those winds a little longer. That's the only reason why Jesus won't come. If that Sunday law is not passed, it's because of God's grace and his mercy for every single person in this building. Why? Because we still fool with sin. We still love sin. done. Brothers and sisters, listen, listen up. I don't know where you are in your Christian experience. I have no idea. I don't know what your life is like. I don't know what your personal devotional life is like. I don't know what your family worships. I have no idea. All I know is that first twin has already been born. Prophecy it's happening so fast, can't even keep up with it. Here's my appeal. The time is short. All heads bowed and eyes closed. You are sitting in this church, and there is a sin that you like. I'm being very specific. You don't want to give up. You don't want to give up this sin, but this sin is severing you from Jesus. 
And all Jesus is saying this morning is, I love you. I just love you so much. I'm delaying in mercy. I love you so much, but I need that sin this morning. I need that sin today before you leave this building. If you have a sin that you love it and you don't want to give it up, raise your hand. Keep them up. I want to see who I'm praying for. Keep them up. I'm very specific. Keep them up. You like the sin. You don't want to give it up. No one's looking around either. We're all praying. Hands down. We're still praying. We're still praying. My second appeal, you are not having good worship with your family, your personal devotion, and you're just being honest with Jesus. Jesus, I need help in my devotional life. I really, really need help. Jesus, I need you to help me. My devotions aren't too good. Raise your hand if you just need help. Right, keep them up. Keep them up. We're praying. Keep them up. Hands down. Last appeal. We're still praying. Last appeal, dealing with the home because Satan hates marriage. This appeal, I'm having problems in my marriage. I need Jesus, I need you to help my marriage. Raise your hand. I need help in my marriage. Raise your hand. Keep them up. Keep them up. See what we're praying for. Keep them up between you and Jesus. Hands down. What we're going to do, we're going to kneel together. We're going to kneel together, and I'm going to give you a few seconds to talk to Jesus. If you raise your hand for any of those appeals, I'm going to give you a few seconds to talk to Jesus about it, and then I'm going to pray. Father in heaven, Father in heaven, we know the presentation is very, is crystal clear. Lord, we are living in the very, very end of time. We, we think we have time to fool around with sin. Oh God, we need so much help. All of us, from the pastor to the layman, we all are in desperate need of Jesus. I pray for those who raise their hands at a first appeal saying, just being honest with you, God, just being honest, that's it. I have a sin that I love and I don't want to give it up, but I know this sin is severing me from Jesus and I need help. God, I pray that you will give them victory. Give them victory over that sin and give them a love for righteousness. I pray for those who raise their hands at a second appeal saying, I, I just need help in my devotional life. It's not the best. And Father, I ask that you'll be with them. Oh, dear God, you just love us so much. You love us so much. Oh, may we never forget it. Pray that we'll all spend time in your word on a daily basis. For those who raise their hands in a third appeal saying, I have uh, problems in my marriage. I pray that you'll be with every one of them. Because Satan, he hates marriage. He hates it. But Jesus, you love it. And Jesus, you're more powerful than Satan. So Lord Jesus, we know that you can mend any broken home. You can mend any broken heart because you're the great physician. And so Father, we place every marriage in the palm of your hands because that's the best place to be. Continue to bless us as a church family. We ask for more power of the Holy Ghost. Bless this congregation that I love so much. And may we truly love each other in this church. Because Ellen White says, the prophet of the Lord says, it is because of strife among God's professed people why he is still delaying his second coming. 
And so, my Lord, may we truly love one another here. So, Father, put within us a love for righteousness and a hatred for sin because sin is the only problem we have on earth. That's it. Bless us. And when you come back the second time, I pray that all of us will be part of the first resurrection or caught up in the air to meet you only because we fell in love with Jesus. Not because we're afraid of you, not because we're scared of you. No, we love you because you first loved us. So Lord, may we hold on to you for dear life, come what may. And may we never give up on Jesus. We love you. In Jesus' name I pray let every child of the king say, Amen. God bless you.